you know, what I'm going to say touches on a lot of similar territory, which is one of the most exciting things, I think, about the state of the climate movement at the moment, when you think about it, is environmentalists and workers' movements like, coming together and having an increasingly sort of shared analysis of what's at stake and, and what the solutions are. So I think that's, that's good news, right? <laughs> Um, and maybe I'll say a bit more specifically about this, the Scottish context as well and looking ahead to um, uh, the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change talks which are coming to Glasgow uh, at the end of next year and what that means for us as a movement, as an opportunity to mobilise around and actually transform our, our, our movements. Um, so yeah, I mean, the climate movement, the environment movement, it's, it's been revitalised, as Simon said, with the emergence of um, the Extinction Rebellion and the school strikes. We've seen mass disruption on the streets of London and around the country. And the biggest ever global, and Scottish, and UK, uh, climate demonstrations ever, right? So we have really big demonstrations around Copenhagen, September, so years ago around the UN talks then, and that was pitched as the last moment to save the climate, the, the last moment to save humanity, and of course we didn't do it then, and 10 years later we still, we still haven't sorted it. But we've seen the biggest demonstrations ever since then uh, on the streets. Um, and that, that emergence just in the last year, so on the back of the, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees, that was very much the, the spur for the emergence of these moments, that sense of there is, we are in decade zero, you know, the clock is ticking down in decade zero if we want to avoid 1.5 or even 2 degrees of warming. And the impacts of climate change obviously just get more and more catastrophic and more and more unpredictable as you breach those two uh, clear sort of uh, levels. So the context has been completely um, transformed by these, these movements, calling for really ambitious targets that kind of fit closer to the science, <coughs> they kind of fit closer to the, the, the justice analysis, which is sometimes more or less absent from these movements' analysis of, of, of what we need to do and how, how we need to do it. And it's starting to have a big political impact, so the climate emergency is high up on the political agenda for the first time. We've seen the Scottish Government, the Welsh Parliament, the UK Parliament all announce climate emergencies. But the reality of the action that we're seeing, that you know, in a, in any sort of announcements and, and, and policies or decisions and all the rest of it, um, uh, since these announcements this spring, you know, they, they're not really delivering the transformative change, they're not pointing to the delivery of the transformative change that we know we need to uh, to see, to, to avoid catastrophic warming. Um, and I think, again, as, as Simon said, like the, the reality is that climate emergency isn't going to go away. It's not going to leave the political agenda because the impacts of climate change are going to be increasingly felt around the world, visible around the world. I mean, California burning is a really, really stark image that sort of makes headlines in the UK more than other parts of the world burning or flooding or you know, being impacted by extreme weather events. That's the sad reality. And, you know, we're not immune here in Scotland either, uh, or throughout the UK, from impacts of flooding, extreme weather, uh, wildfires, all the rest of it, um, multiple and sort of incident impacts. So it's here to stay, right? Climate emergency is here to stay. Um, the Scottish Government, um, recently passed uh, climate change legislation through the Scottish Parliament. So it already had, you know, very proud to say on the world stage that we've got the, the strongest climate change legislation in the world, and that's been the case since we passed um, the first uh, piece of legislation back in uh, 2008, um, 2009, sorry. Uh, so we've updated that supposedly in order to respond to the, the targets um, and the framework around the Paris Agreement. Um, but actually what we saw was the government sort of uh, initially recommending really mediocre targets that clearly didn't respond to Paris Agreement 1.5 or even, you know, well below 2 degrees. And they had to be dragged sort of kicking and screaming and, you know, at the last minute to, to uh, an improved bill, an improved act than, than the one that they'd originally put on the table. But it's still nowhere near enough to reflect a fair share of what Scotland as a historic um, polluter, as a rich industrialised nation that caused the problem, contributed vastly to causing the problem of climate change, 
but we're doing nowhere near our fair share, either in terms of the mitigation uh, side of what a fair share is, as in bringing our emissions down much further uh, and, and faster than uh, countries in, in, in the global south, for example, but also it's completely absent of any of the, the, the other part of, of, of climate justice fair shares, which says we've got to transfer vast sums of finance um, and share technology, not like sell it or send our corporations out to sort of, you know, capitalise on it, but like share, give technology to the global south so that it, nations can develop cleanly, so they can bring standards of living up for the masses, uh, but do so in a way that's clean and, and, and fair. So, um, so the bill, the, 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 the current legislation, sadly it is still the best <laughs> climate legislation in the world, or, you know, give or take, it's one of the best pieces of legislation in the world. And, you know, Nicola Sturgeon and Jacinta Arden as well, as well in, in, in New Zealand, you know, they, they've passed some pretty ambitious um, climate change legislation recently, and they're sort of hailed on the world stage as, as leaders, and they, they are. But the bar is set so low, so terribly low, it's nowhere near where we need to be. So we're, starting to, we're seeing an impact, right? All these climate kind of emergencies announced, some reasonably ambitious, but nowhere near good enough legislation announced. So that's, that's sort of a bit where we are. Um, so <laughs> we've got this sort of sense of where, as the, as the time is running out, right, and as the, the impacts are starting to be felt and seen much more of climate change, and we know that the climate emergency is here to stay, right? We've got to do something about it. That sort of tension between just acting, act, do anything, anything to bring the emissions down, anything to stop the impacts, um, and doing things in a way that is just, both at the sort of domestic level here in Scotland, in a way that's you know, fair and helps tackle inequality, here in Scotland, also just in terms of uh, the wider sort of global context, so remembering that we owe a great carbon debt to the global south and, and sharing our, our, our technology and, and all the rest of it, the tension between just acting and acting in a way that's just sort of become heightened, right? Um, so, and also the sort of context that we're, um, the political context that in which we're operating globally, but also like here in Scotland, here in the UK, you know, with Brexit, the rise of the right, um, Indy Ref too, you know, possibly on the agenda, but all these big mates and, you know, important, but, you know, series of political distractions that's sort of distracting us from doing the real stuff that we really need to do to ensure the survival of you know, the people around the world. Um, you know, that's also a very real sort of risk, but also an opportunity if we can, you know, turn it into one um, that's very present at the moment. Um, so, um, yeah, so just transition narrative, that's obviously like a really important thing that's gaining a lot of traction and that's come, in Scotland, that's come um, to the forefront actually as a result of work that Friends of the Earth are doing with the STUC and a number of affiliate unions and, you know, we're, we're seeing that sort of climb the political agenda and all the rest of it. And it's good because it captures a really important part of the domestic climate <coughs> narrative in that change must not come at the expense of workers and, and, and communities. But we also need to be really vigilant in ensuring that the just transition narrative isn't used as an excuse to overlook the abuses, um, the environmental and human rights abuses that are taking part, place in other parts of the world. So just transition, Green New Deal, shift to low carbon, all the rest of it being used as an excuse for extractivism in, in parts of the global south. So that's something that we're beginning to see is the big mining companies say, oh no, no, it's not, you know, this, this, this awful mine that's gonna, you know, tear up all of this land and you know shift all these indigenous people out of their livelihoods, you know, if it's necessary for the just transition, it's necessary for the, for the uh, low carbon economy. So that's something that we've got to bring into our narratives here. Um, and uh, ensure that we don't, we're not calling for a, for a transition that is you know, kind of just at the domestic level, but is at the expense of, um, a, sort of a, bigger, uh, a bigger and other justice um, narratives. And, sorry, am I running out of time? No. Um, no. Maybe just a quick, quick um, oh, no, okay. Yeah, I, I happen to be. <laughs> Yeah, I think another minute or two. No, okay, quick, another minute or two. So maybe just some of the things that are coming up 
in Scotland specifically <coughs> support for infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure. So the Scottish government, UK government, still blowing the trumpet of maximising economic recovery of oil and gas. Um, obviously, Scottish government don't have powers, they don't have the levers of the licensing, but they do have policy positions on MER. So we need to shift the government away from this um, sort of suicidal obsession with um, maximising economic recovery and you know, put, a, put an end date on North Sea oil and gas extraction and use that timeline to plan for the just transition for workers and, and, and communities. We're also possibly staring a new oil refinery at Range Max in the face. Um, there's proposals for new um, LNG terminal at Huntington. Um, so all of this like big fossil fuel infrastructure that we need to sort of gear up to fight. Um, and you know the risk of these sort of false solutions coming in, so Simon mentions sort of electric cars, and obviously you know the, that was one side of the sort of false solution that is electric cars, but there's also you know their over-reliance on, on, on these rare earth minerals and the sort of extractivism that comes along with that, which is another real challenge around that, but also carbon capture and storage and hydrogen technologies which so sort of string out a, a, a reliance on, on, on fossil fuels and, and sort of an excuse to keep the big um, companies going. So we need to fight these. So COP26, that's what I sort of wanted to end on. Um, so the UN climate talks are coming to Glasgow at the end of next year. Um, and that sort of, it's a really useful moment, opportunity, year, uh, year in the run-up to and legacy afterwards for us as a, as a climate movement at Scottish level, UK, international level, to mobilise round, right? Um, it presents serious challenges in terms of how we come together and get our messaging right and make sure that the, you know, the right, the right voices, right, the, the, the voices of the most impacted are at the forefront of what we're saying. Um, uh, so we're doing some work with um, so Friends of the Earth and, and, and many others in, in civil society are working together to try and bring together a big coalition, a big civil society coalition around COP26, uh, partly to ensure that you don't have to get this sort of fragmentation that means that sort of bigger and better resource organisations are able to sort of control the narrative of civil society and drown out the sort of the, the voices of um, the most impacted and the voices that want to bring their sort of justice analysis into things. So we've, we want to come together as a big coalition with constituencies across trade unions, uh, NGOs, racial and migrant justice groups, youth, direct action, grassroots, climate justice, faith groups, all the rest of it, all the constituencies come together and organise around the COP in a transformative climate justice centred way. I'm just kind of reading our aims out, just next week, because if we want to be part of this coalition or not. Organise around the COP in a transformative climate justice centred way that creates space for hope, and is inclusive and accountable to the breadth of civil society and international climate movements. Use the COP as a moment to strengthen the Scottish, UK and international climate justice movement to build power for system change. So not just about two weeks, it's about the, the road towards the COP and the legacy afterwards. And enable civil society to use the COP as leverage to make gains at the domestic level that advance climate justice and ensure the best outcome from the COP itself. Um, if there's enough time we can sort of say more about some of the actual concrete things that we would do together as a coalition. Um, but just to finish off, so it's Chile, that we want to sort of end by saying something about Chile. So, um, the civil unrest in Chile at the moment, which has led to the Chilean president saying, oops, we can't have a cop here anymore, and also the, the, the other um, international summit came before it. Um, so we cancelled at really short notice, and, and, and the conference has now moved to Madrid, which is obviously to the exclusion of many Global site participants will really struggle to get visa accommodations, travel arrangements at such, such short notice. And this is like, it's something like the fourth out of five COPs that will be in the global north, which is really, really bad for global site participation. Um, so basically, the crisis in Chile, it's, it, it's a timely reminder, right, of the, the interlinked roots of the crisis of inequality and the crisis of, of, of the climate. And we need to ensure that we're bringing that into our narrative around. Uh, well, around stuff we're doing around COP25, but also COP26 and, and, and more broadly, like our movements. Um, there's an international response to um, the, move, the COP being moved from, from uh, Santiago to Madrid that groups can sign on. We can sort of send it around if, if groups want to sign on to that and show support. There's a fundraiser because the People's Summit in Chile is still going ahead. 
and we want to ensure that, that you know that the focus is still there. It's not just in Madrid. So there's a fundraiser to support Chilean groups, which we can also share, and there'll be activities taking place here in Scotland to link up to the People Summit in Chile and show solidarity with the Chilean people. So there's an event in Glasgow on the 1st of December at the STUC. And so they're showing May Pasadena in the evening, but also like an opportunity for workshops and discussions, um, including with like uh, Chilean people in, in Glasgow. Um, and there's a vigil here in Edinburgh uh, on the 6th of December, a vigil for climate justice in solidarity with the Chilean people. Which is also taking time, it's taking place at the same time as the big climate. I'm saying um, it's more than one minute. The big climate demonstrations are happening in Madrid and in Santiago and all around the world. Schools like six, seven. That's it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.